Good morning, members. Um, I'm called this meeting of the State Government Finance and Elections Committee to order for Thursday, March 18th, 2021. Um, and pursuant to House Rule 10.01, this meeting is being held virtually. Um, the committee assistant will take the uh, legend or take the roll. Chair Nelson? I'm here. Vice Chair Carlson? Carlson present. Representative Nash? Present. Representative Bonner? Present. Representative Dreskowski? Present. Representative Elkins? Representative Greenman? Present. Representative Cleborn? Present. Representative Kosnick? Present. Representative Mason? Present. Representative New Brindley? Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, present. Representative Kwong? Present. A quorum is present. Thank you. Um, with that, Representative Kosnick, did you get a chance to look at the minutes from yes, from the uh, 16th? Yes, Mr. Chair, and I move the minutes for adoption. Uh, Representative Kosnick moves approval of the minutes from March 16th, 2021. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, motion to the minutes are approved. Um, Seeing as Representative Becker Finn. <coughs> Don't see her on the call yet. Oh, there she is. Representative uh, Becker sorry, Finn. Mr. Speaker had to uh, do the roll call in my own committee, uh, double zooming this morning. Uh, so uh, oh, well, <laughs> I, I'm sorry I didn't hear you, Mr. Chair. I was just going to say, I was just looking for you. Uh, the first bill on our agenda is House File 903, Representative Becker Finn. And I will move that House File 903 be referred to the General Register. Um, uh, Becker, Representative Becker Finn, I see you have a DE2 amendment. Do you want me to move that first and then we can describe the bill? Uh, yes, please, Mr. Chair. I'll move that. So I'll move the DE2 amendment. It's the author's amendment. So all in favor of the DE2 amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? We have the bill in the way that the the author wants. Uh, proceed with your testimony. And uh, I see you've got testifiers here. And so um, go from there. Be Representative Becker Finn. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I know it's a busy week, so I will uh, save most of my uh, most of my time for my testifiers. Uh, but House File 903 is a, a very important bill that is many decades actually in the making. And uh, what House File 903 does, um, and just so folks know, the the DE2 language is just, um, it, it basically the bill does the same thing. It just cleans up some things and gives a little bit more, um, flushes things out a little bit so that um, it's more clear what we're doing here with House File 903. So um, it would, so right now we have an executive order that requires our executive agencies to uh, consult, to do tribal consultation with our 11 uh, tribal nations here uh, that uh, here in Minnesota. And uh, this actually started back in the Palenti years, continued um, with, with Governor Dayton and um, has been brought to kind of the next level under Governor Walls as far as consultation and, um, you know, treating the government to government relations that we really should have been doing from, from day one um, with our tribal nations. And so what this bill does is it takes the, the executive order uh, that is currently in place and has, you know, some form of the executive order has been in place for quite some time and puts it into statute so that we have it in statute and um, we can maintain uh, those good relationships and that tribal consultation going forward, regardless of who, who the governor is or, uh, you know, who might be um, in charge of the executive orders going forward. And with that, I will turn it over to my testifiers. We have uh, a couple folks here from the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, and uh, as well as some others here to answer questions if folks have them. Thank you, Representative becker -Finn. Um The first person I have on my list is uh, Robert Larson. If you want to identify yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. I'm a Hello, my relatives. Uh, my name is Robert Larson. 
Many folks call me Deuce when they get to know me. I am the president of the Lower Sioux Indian Community and also the chair of the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. Uh, thank you for the time to the opportunity to testify in support of House File 903. Uh, my Dakota name is Tatanki Chop Tong Ta. Loosely translated, that is rolling bull, but it literally takes over a day to explain and understand the meaning of my name. Uh, in short, it's that lead bull when you have a herd and a storm or danger is coming, they gather that herd and they face that storm. And when everything is passed and they look and see that everything's okay, it's when that, that bull is wallowing and kicking up dirt in celebration and gratitude. So just like to understand who I am. Thank you for that. There's so many difficult issues we face as a nation, as separate governments and as human beings. They come down to one thing that we all can't live without and that's relationships. When we do relationships well, everyone benefits. When we lose sight of the importance of relationships or stop working on them, negativity finds a place to grow in the space left between. Relationship is a cornerstone of the bill you have before you, House File 903. And the concept of consultation between state and the tribes. Because no matter what, the state and the tribes <clears throat> today share many things, including geography and citizens. And we face many similar issues. Consultation is a critical way that we can strengthen our relationships and the good work that we can do together. House File 903 requires consultation by certain state agencies and administrative bodies for matters with tribal implications. This creates an expectation that issues that affect us will be discussed with us in a timely way and that our voices are heard in the decision-making process. But it does not mean that we have veto power over agency decisions. It does mean that we will never, it does not mean that we will never disagree. But at a minimum, it should mean that we will communicate and at best we will find a mutually beneficial resolution, create strong partnerships and reduce unnecessary and often expensive conflict. I want to emphasize that this bill does not only benefit the tribes. It is not just a way to fix racial injustice because of the moment we are in. A strong and broad consultation policy benefits the state just as much as the tribes. It is good governance. The state has obligations to all citizens of Minnesota, including those of us who are tribal members. Yet providing services for our population can be unique. By working in partnership with tribes, our systems can not only alleviate strain on local and state direct service providers, we can reduce the long-term strain on state institutions that are created by issues that go unresolved. There are a variety of agreements that state agencies have with tribes. We also deal with the complex jurisdictional issues that are best resolved through communication and engagement, not litigation, because a once solvable problem spiraled into a big problem. <coughs> Excuse me. There are opportunities to work together on issues such as school instruction and awareness, which doesn't benefit only indigenous children, it benefits every child, it benefits us all. To that same end, a critical element of the relationship between the state and the tribes is education for those state employees who are charged with working on tribal related matters. The existing tribal state relations training does just that. Those who first created the tribal state relations training knew that education necessarily creates a better capacity for understanding, for meaningful engagement, and for relationships. Imagine a Department of Human Service staff member who work on social service and mental health issues with tribes and Minnesota's indigenous population. If he or she can be trained to understand generational trauma, 
the long lasting effects of Indian boarding schools, and how our people are battling to break cycles and create healthy families, how much more meaningful and effective could the work of this state employee be? That is why House File 903, which codifies and builds on the policy of Executive Order 1924, includes tribal state relations training for certain staff, as well as the commissioners, deputy and assistant commissioners. I'd like to finish as I began. As Dakota, I believe that I live in relationship with every living thing. It's a responsibility and an honor to nurture those relationships. And so too does this bill reflect a responsibility and honor and an opportunity to strengthen the work our tribal nations do together in relationship with the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Uh, the next person I have on my list is Shannon Geshek. Um, welcome to the committee and please state your name for the tape. Karen Nelson, committee members. Mino Gijigan. My name is Shannon Gijik. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council and a member of the Boy Sport Band of Chippewa. House File 903 codifies and builds upon Executive Order 1924 and the similar executive orders of past governors by focusing on the important work that occurs between the state of Minnesota and the 11 tribal nations within Minnesota's boundaries. Lieutenant Governor Flanagan said back in 2019, when Governor Waltz signed Executive Order 1924, that it is time for policy being done to Indian people to stop and for policy to be done in partnership with Native nations to begin and continue. That is precisely what this bill does. I wanna briefly do two things here with my time today. The first is to provide a bit of background on the amendment that you see um, to the bill as introduced and then secondly, highlight a few of the important elements of the amended language. The original language of House File 903 mirrored uh, Executive Order 1924. Incorporating input from the tribal leaders and tribal staff, and while communicating with the governor's tribal state relations team, revisions were developed with Representative Becker Finn to help further define some important concepts for consultation. We wanted to provide helpful but broad definitions that allowed each agency to, de to develop policy that fits for its work. Feedback was solicited from the tribal liaisons for the state agencies who are right at the intersection of this work between the state and the tribes. The result is an amended amendment that builds upon Executive Order 1924. It requires that the agencies engage in timely and meaningful consultation for matters that have tribal implications. The definition of agencies includes those identified in Executive Order 1924 and administrative bodies that have strong potential for expanding communication and understanding through consultation. Matters that have tribal implications is defined to mean regulations, legislative proposals, policy statements, or other actions that have substantial direct effects on one or more Minnesota tribal governments or on the distribution of power and responsibilities between the state and the tribes. To reiterate what President Larson said, Chair, Chairman Larson stated, the bill does not do a number of important things. It does not require consultation before an agency can make uh, take emergency action on an immediate threat to the health, safety, or welfare of Minnesota citizens. It also does not require a consultation if both the tribe and the agency deems it's unnecessary to do so. It does not give the tribes any additional ability to challenge agency decisions, and it does not create a new cause of action or legal claim if, for example, an agency fails to consult. One of the statutory duties of MIAC is to recommend to state government the means to enhance the delivery of services to members of federally recognized tribes in Minnesota. To that end, we strongly recommend the consultation and education policies embodied in House File 903. Thank you to the committee and miigwech to Representative Becker Finn. I am happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Ms. Geshe. Uh, the next person I have on my list is Levi Brown. 
And if you want to begin to identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Chair and Committee. Uh, my name is Levi Brown. Thanks for the opportunity to provide testimony on House File 903. MnDOT has over 1,211 miles of infrastructure that is located within Indian Country. And we are responsible to maintain or upgrade this critical asset that all Minnesotans enjoy. This necessitates MnDOT to be constantly working government to government with tribal nations using diplomacy to ensure that the relationship is maintained because often Minnesota state law is not the exclusive applicable law. <clears throat> As the Office of Tribal Affairs Director, I've learned a valuable lesson, which is to be successful, MnDOT and tribal nations must collaborate on any construction or maintenance work that may impact tribal nations. Our agency has made huge mistakes by not consulting with tribal nations. These mistakes have disturbed Dakota and Anishinaabe ancestral burial sites while causing delays and costing our agency millions of dollars. I bear witness to examples of tribal and state partnership, partnerships around land issues, whether it was by, was it, whether it was the Red Bee Bridge on the Red Lake Nation or the Highway 200 project on the White Earth Nation that is currently correcting over eight miles of incorrect right away. It is these complex issues that can help guide us to the efficient solutions we also dearly want to find. Land has historically driven a wedge between state and tribal government, but in a lot of ways, it's ironic that it's this preservation of land and cultural resources that may bring tribal and state governments to a lasting partnership. The partnership with tribal nations also includes MnDOT navigating certain regulatory processes. Example, Army Corps of Engineer 404 permit and the 401 certification in which some tribes have created their own federally approved water quality standards, which MnDOT must comply with. In closing, MnDOT cannot avoid a government-to-government -government relationship with tribal nations. As the designated tribal liaison under Executive Order 1924, I've been tasked with helping MnDOT be successful when working with tribal nations. And because of our historical norms, this task some, it seems impossible some days. But I do know that stabilizing a government-to-government -government relationship with tribal nations will increase efficiency and quality of transportation for all Minnesota residents. Miigwech. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I have one other person here that's listed on my, on my agenda as being here to answer questions. I'm Ms. Jesse Stomsky Sam. Um, um, and with that, I'll go to questions unless she needs to speak. Um, I see her shaking her head no. Um, Representative Nash, do you want to be the last questioner or do you want to go in right, right now? Oh, I can jump in now, Mr. Chair. Representative uh, Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to the author, um, thanks for bringing the bill. Would it be fair to say that this might be sort of like a formalization of embassies being set up with, with other government? Uh, to me, that if I were to try to describe it to somebody that doesn't live at the Capitol every day, um, would that be a fair assessment in your opinion? Representative becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and to be clear, you know, and I think we all know this, but we can't, uh, we can't as a legislature <laughs> tell tribal nations what to do. Um, but what this bill would do would say that uh, would be sort of, I, I think that's an apt comparison, except that it's not, um, this itself is a bill that we would pass here and is not a contract um, right. between ourselves and, and the tribal governments, because we can't tell them what to do as a separate government. But this would just formalize our intention in the way that we as a state interact with these tribal nations. Representative Nash. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And yeah, Representative becker Finn, I, I, I tried to find the, the, the most apt thing to compare it to. Uh, and I think it's a good idea. I think that, you know, we should work with uh, the folks who we live next to, but are of different governments. And, and I think that this is a, a fine approach to do that and uh, appreciate you bringing the bill. Thank you, Representative Nash. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair and um, Representative Becker Finn. Uh, I appreciate the thoughtfulness of the language. I too am supportive of the bill. Um, the only question I have is I'm wondering if you could give us maybe some examples or clarification on lines 2.19 through 2.22, um, talking about matters that have tribal implications. Um, it's, it seems like, and, and it is further defined, right? That have substantial direct effects on one or more Minnesota tribal government or on the distribution of power and responsibilities between the state and the tribal government. 
I'm wondering if you can give us some examples of things that would fall into this and things that might not fall into this. Because it seems like if we think of it broadly, almost anything could fall into this, but it seems like you're trying to be more specific with that language. Representative Becker Finn or one of your testifiers. Uh, thank you, Chair Nelson. And I, I guess off the top of my head, um, uh, for instance, something like, uh, it, let's talk chronic wasting disease. Uh, you know, so uh, a DNR regulation or the things that we do within the DNR and the Board of Animal Health might implicate how a disease spreads within the state. We may not have any uh, positive CUD, CWD cases that are within uh, reservation boundaries, but um, it would have great implications for a tribe if it impacted the wild deer herd and the ability of tribal members to have deer that they could safely harvest and eat. So uh, that would be one example. I'm sure Mr. Brown would have an example within MnDOT if, if you want more examples, but that would just be one sort of example, the kind of thing we're talking about, where it doesn't have to do exactly with the statute relating to um, interactions with tribes, but obviously would have really big implications for a tribal community um, if the state uh, wasn't taking their uh, treaty rights and, and other implications into account. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Representative Becker, Becker Finn. And I know, as you said, Mr. Brown indicated uh, some transportation issues with, with the building of bridges and whatnot that, that would also apply. I appreciate that. Uh, Representative uh, Bonner. Uh, just really briefly, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you to Representative Becker Finn and, and to our testifiers. And of course, thank you um, to Mr. Larson for sharing uh, the very regal story behind uh, your name. Um, it's certainly uh, wonderful to hear that. Um, I just wanted to briefly say, you know, thank you for coming here to talk about this and, and talking about how we um, solidify that relationship uh, between uh, the tribal nations and our state. Um, really, whenever we build something on mutual respect and we're able, that equals good governing. And so, uh, thank you, Representative Becker Finn, for bringing it forward, and thank you to our testifiers for really speaking to the heart of the matter on why those relationships are so critical uh, for us here. Thank you. I see no further questions. Uh, Representative Becker Finn, if you want to wrap up, and then we'll I'll renew my motion. Yep. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I really want to thank my testifiers for making time, especially uh, President Larson, uh, for, for joining us this morning. It's not every day that we hear from our uh, tribal leaders uh, in our committees. And so um, I thank him for sharing his time and his perspective. I think it's incredibly important. And I just uh, really appreciate the, the questions. And it, you know, it really seems uh, that members of the committee understand the gravity of this and how important this is. And so I really, really appreciate the, the seriousness um, and um, taking this, uh, you know, really listening uh, this morning. I know it's hard this time of year and I do really appreciate that. So uh, would appreciate member support, Chi Miigwech. Thank you, Representative Becker Finn. Um, with that, I'll renew my motion that House File 903 be referred, as amended, be referred to the General Register. Uh, Ms. Spreck, if you want to take the roll. Chair Nelson? Aye. Vice Chair Carlson? Carlson, aye. Representative Nash? Aye. Representative Bonner? Aye. Representative Draskowski? Aye. Representative Elkins? Aye. Representative Greenman? Aye. Representative Cleborn? Aye. Representative Kosnick? Aye. Representative Mason? Aye. Representative New Brindley? Aye. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, aye. Representative Quam? Aye. With a vote of 13 ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails. The motion prevails and the, bu the bill is being referred to the General Register. Thank you, Representative Becker Finn. The next bill on our agenda is House File 447, Representative Acom. Um, and I'll move House File 447 be re-referred to the Health, Finance, and Policy Committee. Welcome to the committee, Representative Acom. Uh, you can please describe your bill. And uh, um, I see we, uh, before we get started, I see we have an A1 amendment. Do you want us to do that first? Yes, please. Uh, I'll move the A1 author's amendment. Um, all in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Opposed? You have the bill in the way the author wants it. Um, Representative Acom, you want to describe your bill? Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the State Government Finance Committee. Thank you for the opportunity this morning to present House File 447, a bill to improve breast cancer screening. Uh, Dana Carter with the Susan G. Komen organization has submitted written testimony in lieu of an appearance today. While this is state government, um, the state government committee, I feel it's important to give you just a little background about why this um, issue is important to women's health. As many of you know, breast cancer is one of the most common forms of cancer affecting women. In fact, one in eight um, of all women will be diagnosed with breast cancer at some point in their lifetime. In Minnesota alone, 4,850 women will be diagnosed with breast cancer and 640 will die from the disease this year. Breast cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death in women. To combat this, the medical community agrees on the benefit and value of early diagnosis. According to the American Cancer Society, women with breast cancer identified and treated early have a five-year survival rate of 99% compared to a projected 28% survival for those diagnosed late. As a result, regular mammograms have become the basic preventative service services recommended by the federal government and are covered by most insurance plans nationwide at no cost to the patient. When a, women's, when a woman's regular screening mammogram indicates something unusual, her doctor often orders a follow-up diagnostic scan to clarify the issue. To most women, any follow-up test is still part of the overall preventative screening process. However, follow-up imaging is not always free and can be subject to a wide variety of cost-sharing terms established by individual health plans. This can create an unintended financial barrier for women to this important health screening process. I have personally seen this problem myself. In the past, my doctor brought me back for follow-up testing after a routine mammogram showed an area of concern. When arranging the second appointment, I remember the scheduler telling me I would need to pay $150 for the follow-up procedure, even though the mammogram was inconclusive. I questioned this since my doctor ordered the second test to be able to fully evaluate my initial screening. She said it was due to my health insurance, but that I was worth it, whatever the cost. I did think I was worth it, and I believe all women are worth it. For the same reason that preventative mammograms are free, this bill seeks to ensure that no woman postpones or foregoes completing their breast cancer screening due to financial barriers. Some might argue that this is an added health insurance mandate that will increase costs, but I disagree. When the federal government established preventative guidelines for mammograms, they did so on strong scientific evidence that doing so would reduce deaths increase survival rates, lengthen life expectancy, and save money. In fact, the CDC cites multiple studies on their website that show breast cancers diagnosed at early stage are much less ex expensive to treat than those diagnosed at, late, at a late stage. Free preventative breast cancer screenings are already a basic requirement for health plans precisely because they are effective and save money. Any additional tests to clarify the findings of those regular mammograms should also be part of that same process. A screening should not be considered complete if the result is inconclusive. Others might be concerned that this bill will increase premiums on CGIP members and be a burden to agency budgets. I also disagree, as this change applies only to women and then specifically to a small subset of them who are eligible for preventative mammograms for federal guidelines. Within that group, it's estimated that 12% are called back for additional testing. This bill only shifts the cost sharing responsibility for an additional imaging, not the entire cost of the follow-up testing. I am aware that MMB provided a fiscal note on the bill this morning, and unfortunately there wasn't time to discuss the assumptions with them. Even if accepting their fiscal note as presented, the overall financial impact of this bill is minimal next to the one plus billion dollar CGIP budget. Any added costs would be distributed against all agencies and funding sources.
with only a fraction of those attributable to general funds. I believe agencies would easily be able to absorb minor changes within their existing budgets and FIGA would be reimbursed for any added expenses. I am a breast cancer survival, survivor myself and I believe my success is due to early diagnosis treatment. I also believe that all women should have barrier free access to early diagnosis and the same chance to overcome cancer that I was given. I would ask for your support of House File 447 and I stand for questions. Thank you, Representative Acom. Um, mentioning the fiscal note, Ms. Roberts, if you want to explain the fiscal note briefly. Sorry about that. That's Mr. okay. Chair and members, um, um, as Representative Acom said, the, the fiscal note uh, from MMB represents the enterprise costs for any additional costs for CGIP. And the numbers on the front page are um, the estimated increased cost to state agencies across all agencies. And then uh, broken down by a uh, general fund is about 33% of those costs and all other funds about 67% of the costs. Um, I can point you to on page um, 10 of the fiscal note, um, there's uh, some discussion about their assumptions. And then on the very last sentence on that page, it says under this language, CGIP expects to experience an average increase in per member per month spending of 17 cents. Thank you, Ms. Roberts. Um, Representative Acom, um, I see we have questions. Representative uh, New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Acom. I just have a couple of questions. Um, one to the author, I'm wondering why are medical assistance and Minnesota care exempted in this bill? Uh, Rep Representative Acom. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative New Brindley. I think that's a great question. And um, we can all remember back a few months ago when the session was beginning and our budget situation was at a budget deficit. And so I was concerned about the overall financial implications to our, um, to our budget. And so I thought the best chance I would have of getting this passed um, would be to just target those um, that are private insurance and that I, because this is an issue that's very important to me, would continue to work on this going forward um, to add those costs in. I did reach out to, um, or I actually asked Mr. Berg to reach out to, um, the Department of Health to ask them about what the cost would be for including uh, medical assistance and Minnesota care. And I did check with him again this morning and they haven't gotten that information back, but believe me, it's important to me and something I would certainly um, want to expand this to cover. Representative Newbringley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, that's actually really concerning to me. I mean, we're trying to, we're addressing the costs, but we're not addressing the cost for the poorest Minnesotans, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense here. Um, I, I'm wondering if, is there anyone on the call from the Minnesota Council of Health Plans? I'm wondering if there's anyone available to answer questions. Maybe not, it looks like a small group on the it, it, Zoom today. It doesn't, today, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see anyone representing New Yeah, it looks like a small group today. I, I'd be interested to know what the increased costs will be uh, for insurers across the board. I know that, they indicated a, a very small cost for CGIP, um, but it'd be interesting to know the rest. We're also, we, we um, the, the discussion has been around women. I'm wondering, I actually, my father-in-law had breast cancer. I'm wondering, are men covered under this as well? Representative Acom. Um, yes, everybody that receives mammograms would be covered, absolutely. And just to circle back about the um, concerns with Minnesota care and um, medical assistance, in um, the hearing that we had in the Health Finance Committee, um, a, a representative from, I believe it was the Health Department was asked um, your question. And I think their, their um, statement at that point was that the out of pocket for um, Minnesota care, I believe, and I, I shouldn't, I think they said it was $3. And so it significantly lower though also out of pocket um, and something that I would want to um, make sure we could address. It's important that all women have access to um, this important breast cancer screening at no cost. Representative New Brindley, follow up. Thank, 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate um, those responses. I, I really, I frankly, as somebody who uh, had a spouse with ALS, I'm very sensitive to the cost of healthcare. And, and certainly my family has borne significant burden of the cost of healthcare. And, um, and yet I also, um, I'm also concerned about how this is set up. I don't think it's practical or, or logical to expect no cost of healthcare. And, and there are costs associated with it. And frankly, for my family, while, while there were things that were very, very expensive at the time, we could afford to pay them. And so we should. We should participate in the costs when we have the means to do so. Um, so I'm concerned about the sweeping generalizations on this. It seems actually more logical that we would cover this stuff for those on medical assistance and, Medi and, and Minnesota care than we would on the others, and yet we're exempting the lowest um, income Minnesotans, which just seems really backwards. I'm a no on this today. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Newbrindley. Uh, Representative Quam. Uh, thank you, Madam, or Mr. Chair. Um, to the author, it, it seems small, but health disparities happen when we separate who is included and who is not included um and just on principle um you know that the last line of questioning reminded me that on principle we should if it's important make sure it's it's across the board um and i don't know if it's easier in this case to um, have language enabling you know the same treatment of of standard copay or um, if it's better budget-wise to have it include the uh, you know the government programs, but um, that that's the irrit irritant for me is when we do a bill on health care. Um, if it's good to do, then it should be across the board. Um, and I, I didn't know if the author wanted to, to comment that or not. It, it, it's just something that is a burr under the saddle for me. Representative Acom, and I think you mentioned that in your, your early, early remarks about why you set it up the way you did, but Representative Acom. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Quam. And I appreciate that um, you also asked this question in the um, health committee and um, ultimately women, or those who, who need mammograms on a regular basis, um, they're, they're provided, um, an initial screening is provided because we know it's important and we know that it saves lives and saves money. And so when that screening is not found to be conclusive, it only to me makes sense that those follow, that follow up imaging or screening would also be covered to ensure we come up with a conclusive result. And as far as including all, I completely and 100% agree. And um, certainly you have my commitment that I will continue to work on this. It has been challenging with um, our staff to be able to, with how hard we're working remotely, to be able to um, get the documents that we've needed for this and the information. And so um, Representative Quam, you asked the question about um, the cost to medical assistance and Minnesota care. And it's still information that I'm very interested in and waiting for. And so I, um, I appreciate the question back in the committee um, in health finance and I appreciate it again today and continue to um, work towards that uh, information. Representative Quam, follow up. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, no. Representative Nash. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I will echo what Representative New Brindley brought forward. I had a neighbor uh, male who died of breast cancer. And that was one of my uh, first questions. But I guess I'm a no for the, the reason that this is not being universally applied, that there are exclusions. And to the author, uh, if you had anticipated these exclusions and and want to address them, I, I, I wish you would have put it in your bill uh, from the beginning. And, I, you know, if you can fix that, 
that changes the narrative and changes the outcome of the bill. But in the, in the big picture of things, I can't support this. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Nash. Any further questions? If not, Representative Akim, if you want to do a quick follow up and then we'll get to our vote. Thank you, committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today um, and I ask for your support. Nice, nice, consinct, or succinct fall of review. With that, I'll renew my motion that House File 447 be re referred to the Health, Finance, and Policy Committee. And uh, Ms. Spreck, can you take the roll? Chair Nelson? Aye. Vice Chair Carlson? Carlson, aye. Representative Nash? Nash, no. Representative Bonner? Aye. Representative Drazkowski? Representative Elkins? Aye. Representative Greenman? Aye. Representative Cleborn? Representative Cleborn? You're muted. Aye. Representative Kosnick? Aye. Representative Mason? Aye. Representative New Brindley? No. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, aye. Representative Quam? Pass. Representative Draskowski? Representative Quam? Looks like Representative Draskowski during the meeting has been dropping on and off. Representative Draskowski is a no. Thank you, Representative Draskowski. Yeah, it looks like he's been having some um, technology issues. He's been I've been watching the screen and it looks like he's been dropping on and off the committee. Uh, well, the vote, the vote of Brent. nine ayes and three nays, the motion prevails. The motion prevails, the bill's on its way to Health Finance and Policy Committee. Thank you, Representative Acom. The next bill we have is Representative Scott's House File 1488. Um, I'll move that House File 1488 be referred to the Committee on Civil Law and Judiciary. And I see we have two amendments. Um, do you want to do those right away, Representative Scott? Good morning, Mr. Chair. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, I'll move the A1 author's amendment. Uh, members, all in favor of, if you want to briefly describe what that, that does, Representative Scott. Um, right, so the A1 just says that the, um, the commission members will be, uh, so the staff um, will use existing resources. Um, for this commission. Thank you, Representative Scott. With that, Rep um, all in favor of the A1 author's amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? A1's done. Uh, the, I'll move the A2 amendment and Representative Scott, if you want to describe the A2 amendment. So the A2 um, just says that the commission members uh, won't be compensated over and above. You know, I think we all get 10 days of interim pay. Um, you know, for meeting during the interim. Um, certainly that interim pay could be used for that, but otherwise we won't be compensated additionally. Um, for Thank you, meeting. Representative Scott. Uh, members, all in favor of the A2 author's amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Uh, Representative Scott, do you want to describe your bill? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, so this is the reinstatement of the um, Legislative Commission on Data Practices. It was originally established in 2014. Um, uh, the bills were carried by uh, in the House, Representative uh, Mary Liz Holberg and in the Senate, um, Senator Dibble. And it passed out of the Senate 63 to zero and the House 124 to three. And members, what this does is um, this commission is uh, a really important uh, commission. Um, it it um, considers issues that have to do um, with government transparency and also with um, with personal privacy. And there's always a balance there as we, as we know and trying to find that balance is not always easy. So that's one of the things that this commission does is we, we hear um, those issues and then um, oftentimes make a recommendation to the legislature on specific issues. Um, so that's what this does. Um, and it's also um, a great way for more members um, to learn more about um, chapter 13 of our statutes. Uh, a lot of people are intimidated by that. 
Um, but if you serve on this commission, it's a really great way to learn more about Chapter 13. Thank you, Representative Scott. Um, questions, I see Representative Nash, you have your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative Scott, thank you for uh, trying to bring this back. I, I guess my question first is, um, why did it go away? Uh, Representative Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Representative Nash for the question. It was really an oversight in the last biennium that it didn't get thrown in um, for renewal. It has to be, it had to be renewed every two years. So um, that's, that's really the reason. Representative Nash. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and um, Representative Scott and members, you know, as somebody who makes his living talking about cybersecurity, and I know that comes as a great shock to talk about cybersecurity for the chair, um, data security information and implications of policy relative to data and its security is extremely important. And I'm just grateful that Representative Scott has been a, a watchdog on this for years. Uh, this is an important effort and it, sh it clearly is bipartisan. Um, when my friend Representative Lesh was in the, the uh, legislature, he too was very much uh, in favor of this. And I hope that we can provide Representative Scott a unanimous vote on this uh, today. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Nash. I'm shocked that you've been, I've never heard you talk about computer security. Anyway, uh, Representative Carlson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Representative Scott, it's good to see you. Um, having uh, previously served on judiciary, um, these are issues that uh, came up quite frequently. And um, you know, chapter 13 is, is, is very much alive and well in terms of what we are, are seeing today. You know, you look back at when this was first established in 2014, license plate readers, uh, police body cams, uh, facial recognition is now a hot topic, drone surveillance, uh, now we're dealing with uh, deep fake videos. I mean, the legislature is gonna have to weigh in on all these issues. So I think it just speaks to the importance of the commission. Um, my question for you though, Representative Scott is, um, you know, and is there an opportunity here to maybe broaden some of the membership, uh, bring in some of these subject matter experts? You know, I look at all the IT professionals, um, you know, in, county government. A lot of us are former uh, county administrators or our city council members and, you know, folks that are just dealing with these issues on a day-to-day -day uh, basis have a real inherent, um, you know, are living and breathing these issues. Is, is there some value in expanding the membership to some of those subject matter experts? Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would say that um, we bring in those subject matter experts when we have our commission meetings. And um, my, my fear is one of the reasons I brought the amendments today was just the fiscal cost. And my fear is, is putting outside people um, on this commission um, that that would go away, they would need to be compensated in some way. Um, but certainly we bring those people in all the time when we have our hearings and um, we listen very closely to what they have to say and their expertise, um, and it influences our decisions. So um, I understand what you're trying to do. I, the bill does allow for former legislators um, that have an interest in this. Um, Don Betzold was a senator that um, had um, an interest in Chapter 13 and dealt in this area um, when he was in the legislature. So people like him or Representative Holberg, those folks, um, you know, Again, we get into the compensation piece. So uh, um, I certainly understand where you're going with that, um, Representative Carlson. And um, I would just say we bring those people in on a regular basis to get their expert opinion. And we have plenty of expertise within our own legislature. Um, I know Representative Elkins, Representative Nash, um, Representative Lucero, all of those folks work in this area um, for their professional lives. So I think it would be good to um, maybe have them have a turn on the commission. Thank you, uh, Representative Carlson. Any follow-up? Uh, Representative Elkins. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair um, and uh, Representative Scott, and, and thank you for bringing the bill. I, I am one of the co-authors on, on this bill. Uh, during the 2019 interim, uh, because I do have a, a strong interest in, uh, in data privacy issues in, in particular, I think in, in this body, uh, 
Representative uh, Nash is our premier expert on uh, cybersecurity issues, and I'm trying to make privacy a specialty of mine. But in 2019, I, I actually attended most of the uh, meetings of this commission, uh, observed them, and, and re recognized that the, it was a, a very highly functioning committee. The members always attended, and the uh, uh, the the uh, issues that are being discussed are very complicated and deserving of uh, uh, a thorough analysis before this this body before they they come to us as a, a full legislator just to get them chewed up. In 2019, the big issue was drone data, and the thing is that you know as, as technology uh, advances, uh, it keeps throwing up new categories of data. Uh, you know, I myself have a data practices bill, uh, you know, this year that, that just deals with uh, data uh, generated by shared mobility companies that uh, might come into the hands of, of a state or local government unit. So it's it, it's an area that uh, um, is, uh, of, you know, it, it's constantly evolving. It needs constant oversight and it needs the kind of, uh, of deep analysis that can be done during an interim by a committee like this. So I strongly support it. Representative Elkins, that sounded more like an, uh, a statement than a question, but uh, uh, that's fine. That's fine. No, I'm just, uh, I'll represent Claiborne. You had a question. You had your hand up. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would like to thank Representative Scott for bringing this bill forward. It's really important to me. I'm a privacy geek. Uh, I don't like having all of this data available. And I appreciate the fact that it is uh, legislators and I appreciate the fact that you think we're an intelligent group of people. <laughs> but I also think it's really important that we look to the intelligent people who are also our you know, county and city uh, representatives and that they have a voice here. Um, just as we heard in the last bill, right? Cost, we always have to be mindful of cost and how we're spending our state dollars. but. It, we can't allow that also to be a limiting factor of doing things the right way. And I would ask you to think about that as we move forward. Um, we need to make sure that all, all of the people who need to be at the table are at the table and that we are working on this in a comprehensive way. So that's the only comment that I have, but I really do appreciate the fact that you're bringing this forward. Thank you. And it's like if the previous bill we had, I think, Representative Scott might have had this bill written before we the better uh, February forecast came out and but I'll let Representative Scott answer that question. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, I guess I would just go back to the fact that we have these people come before us. We've we've worked with the League of Minnesota Cities, we've worked with local units of government um, on issues. And so they've been at the testifiers table at our hearings. And um, so that won't, nothing about that will change. Um, we will continue um, to do that. And I, you know, I do know that, um, you know, doing the right thing is doing the right thing. Um, and the cost shouldn't always be a factor. Um, but in this case, I think that um, the commission is really functioning very well. And we invite anybody to come in and testify and, and work with all the stakeholders. The drone legislation, for instance, and even the license plate reader data was worked on for years with all the stakeholders. And I feel like we struck the right balance on those bills. And Mr. And, uh, Chairman. Representative Claiborne. Yeah, I just, you know, I do appreciate that. And Representative Scott, I think you and I would both agree that there's a difference between coming in and testifying and having an actual seat at the table. And I'm just asking us to consider broadening that table. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and another comment that Representative Claiborne had is that I wouldn't want to say that our staff, the people that we have work for us on both sides of the aisle, all it make us all look a lot more intelligent than we are. I mean, and we, I want to thank the staff for all their hard work. Uh, Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Scott, and I, too, uh, really think that this is an important issue. I'm wondering, sort of, and, and I agree with Representative Cleborn that uh, we need to make sure that we have sort of the full set of expertise at the table. I'm wondering if you have a sense of, um, I know we have a lot of other boards um, and committees and commissions that have um, those sort of representatives from local government or subject matters. Do you have a sense, as you're thinking about weighing the costs, of how much it would actually cost 
um, to add potentially um, subject matter experts to the um, uh, to the policy. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I I don't, uh, Representative Greenman. Thank you for the question. Um, the only other time that we've added um, a cost to this committee uh, was when we. Uh, I think it was $40,000 um, to have a part-time staff person that did a lot of our research and put together, um, you know, um, reports and those sorts of things. Um, that's the only other time that um, that we've had a cost to the committee outside of the legislature and, and normal House staff, so or House and Senate staff. So um, I I suppose to get an idea, you'd um, have to look at what other um, what other similar bodies are doing and what it costs them. Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Scott. I think that this is a really good idea, and I think having um, uh, investing in having that those folks at the table is really important. And I, I think what we've seen with other uh, um, uh, boards and commissions is it's not that great a cost, but it is really important um, that we uh, have that broad, robust uh, participation of all the stakeholders um, and so I uh, hope that you'll consider that moving forward if cost is the the only thing uh, only reservation you have thank you see uh, representative Elkins I was gonna say see no more questions but representative Elkins quickly I'll keep this very quick so um, my observation in the the summer that I spent uh, shadowing uh, the, this LCC committee in 2019 is that uh, um, most of the, the stakeholders that should be involved were regular attendees and testifiers. And, you know, through attending these meetings that I met people like uh, Matt Ailing from uh, the Minnesota Council on Government Information, who I, I now regularly collaborate with, along with uh, Irene Gao and Mel Reeder from the Minis League of Minnesota Cities, um, Julia Decker from ACLU, uh, Leah Patton from the uh, Minnesota County Technology Leadership Association um, are, are all people who are, you know, either legal or technical subject matter experts and uh, regularly contributed to the uh, deliberations of, the, of this body. So the, the, the right people do attend these meetings and uh, aren't shy about appearing at the testifiers table when it's appropriate. Now, seeing no further questions, Representative Scott, you want to wrap up and then we'll get to a vote. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. And I, I think, um, thank you for um, everybody's positive feedback. And um, I think we have several prospective members of the commission on this committee um, that have expressed interest and that's really a positive because um, the more um, institutional knowledge we can get in this area from members, the better decisions uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna make in the legislature. So thank you members. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the hearing. Thank you, Representative Scott. Uh, with that, I'll renew my motion that House File 1488, as amendment, be referred to the Committee on Law and Judiciary. And with that, Rep. Ms. Sprick, can you take the roll? Chair Nelson? Aye. Vice Chair Carlson? Carlson, aye. Representative Nash? Aye. Representative Bonner? Aye. Representative Draskowski? Aye. Representative Elkins? Aye. Representative Greenman? Aye. Representative Cleborn? Aye. Representative Kosnick? Aye. Representative Mason? Aye. Representative New Brindley? Aye. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, aye. Representative Quam? Aye. With a vote of 13 ayes and zero nays, the motion prevailed. The motion prevails. The bill's on its way to the civil law and judiciary. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, members. Members, the next two bills we have are bills that we have sent over from the Senate. Um, and there again, again, there are a couple of vehicle bills, um, possible vehicle bills, and uh, we have as backups. And the first bill is House File 2029. It's I'm the author of that bill, and uh, uh, members. Um, this is just basically what the bill does. I'll, I'll move the bill to be, late, to, be, to be laid over. And with that, members, what this bill does is it just basically right now, the November forecast, it says it has to be done in the first week of December. This sets a date specific of, of December 6th 
of the November forecast has to be out by. And with that, members, uh, any questions of the bill? Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, does this have any implication for costs for those that have to prepare it uh, inside the, the state government? And is there a fiscal note? And just wondering. Um, uh, Representative Nash, I do not believe there's a fiscal note yet. Um, if we, when this comes up off the table, we will probably have one by then. My understanding is they currently have to have it in the first week, which is one through seven of December. Um, so they're having to prepare it at this time frame anyway. This just says this, they have to have it by the sixth. Um, so that I don't think it would change much of the fiscal note. Representative Draskowski. But Okay. Or Representative Nash, follow up, sorry. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess I understand it's a vehicle bill, but I mean, I, I'm just thinking about our various staffs and, and uh, how that might implicate Thanksgiving and other things like that, requiring them to come in early and stay late uh, during times where they have family. So just uh, exercising some caution. I understand it's being laid over, but um, and you look for creative things to create a vehicle bill with, but this one seems to be not, not uh, the most inspired idea from my perspective. Representative Skowski. Now my question is, is gone, Mr. Chair. Okay. With that, members, any other questions? If not, we'll lay this bill over. And then the next bill we have is House File 2030. And again, this is a bill that represent or that Senator Kiffmeyer sent over. And uh, let me pull the bill up here. So I it's it basically just that it uh, positive general fund balance use notification is the short description of the bill. And again, it's uh, um, here, there we go, I'm looking at my calendar. Pull it up here and it just basically adds a couple of words and, and changes a couple of things in the, in the bill. Um, and again, it's, this is just being laid over for, again, as a possible vehicle bill in the future. Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, but hasn't this, budget transfer already happened and wouldn't this be seen as duplicative and does it have any true implications on something that's already occurred? Uh, I think I'll ask Mr. Mr. Gehring about that. Mr. Gehring. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Nash, yeah, that's correct. So, so what this bill is doing is basically deleting an obsolete reference in the statute because the transfer has already occurred to the Clean Water Fund. Representative Nash. I'm good. Any other questions? If not, members, I'll lay this bill over for for, for possible future use. Um, with that, members, uh, we don't have anything else on our agenda. Um, our next meeting is, will be is to be determined, um, members. Uh, so we don't have a meeting tomorrow. Um, enjoy your weekend. Uh, with that, if there are any other questions, we are adjourned.